Welcome. Welcome to Omnifactory. Scratch that. Welcome to Omnifactory. Yes, it's been rebranded. So technically, I played this pack one other time, but I didn't get very far. I didn't get anywhere close to getting Applied Energistics, which is probably why I stopped playing. That was possibly years ago at this point. Round two was looking a lot better. I'm enjoying the pack a lot more, so I thought it'd be kind of cool to do a little bit of a base tour, show the progress, where we are, where we're headed, sort of thing. My understanding with this pack and some of these expert packs in particular is you set up all these systems that you're constantly having to upgrade and tear down from various uh, bottlenecks. So it's kind of interesting to get a snapshot of the early game to see what it progresses into. Taking a quick look at the quest book here, kind of push through all this basic stuff, skipped a few things I'm not interested in like flying. At the beginning chapter, you can push into AE2 right away, which is what everybody suggests for your sanity. And I can see why... I'm still playing because I rushed it, and it's awesome to have. I set up a pretty comprehensive deep mob learning for basic resources. Very awesome to have, well worth the effort. And some of these low voltage machines, I'm kind of just past now. I'm not going to automate, but some of these things, like uh, these alloys here, I'll have to set up a system for. Same with grades of infinity. I haven't done that yet. I got to get back to it. Going on to the next chapter here, we've got the auto crafting, some fluid item storage. I have to wrap up some of these machines. Some of these components to make these circuits. Got these partially automated, but I need to come back and improve the automation. And this I'm not going to push any further into until I've fixed up the aforementioned things because. My system is not as robust as I would like it. This is a heck of a lot easier if you have a really good auto crafting system. So early, early game, when I first started, I was in this chunk. You can see the floor is uh, each chunk's a different kind of pattern. Throw the uh, F9 on, we can see how it's divvied up. I had tons of drawers and they were all two by two drawers, the ones that are split. And it was just tons of them were in this chunk. And I had my low voltage machines there dumping Anything they made were getting dumped into tons and tons of these controller slaves. And I had a row of these where all of these crafting stations from Greg Tech were connected to. So then I could have tons of recipes saved in this crafting station, if you're familiar with how it works. And it can see the entire drawer array, which works really good early game. I actually made a YouTube video on setting up a pretty excessive one. It's honestly not worth it. It's way better just to push into AE2. But if you're kind of a slow player like me, potentially it's kind of cool to have a system like that because uh, it helps take away a lot of the grind before you get an AE2 system set up. This is the very first thing I kind of made in this dimension was the sugarcane farm for your fuel, for your, I think it was your steam generator for, for early power. But uh, it doesn't really do much now. It just kind of keeps a stock of... Uh, Sugar cane for me. I got a couple circuits being made in these inscribers. I have to tear this down, put it somewhere else, and automate it. This is all my item storage, basically, besides the drawers, of course. And it's still looking pretty good. I see something's full. It wasn't full earlier today. And these are all liquids. And of course, they're all partitioned and named, so we don't have any funny business with our liquid management. And same goes up here more liquids. You can see, you get tons of hydrogen. This blast furnace design is very popular. I've seen a lot of people use it. Basically, it shares the frame of the one before it. So I have them kind of halfway automated at the top. I think this guy passively is constantly making aluminum. Um, this guy's energetic alloy. And then this guy's kind of special. He's actually making vibrant alloy, which uses energetic alloy, which you put a limit on it. So it doesn't make more than 700. So this is actually turned off right now. And these are a few other things I forget. But they're not fully automated because I haven't actually pulled the AE2 system over yet. It's kind of a work in progress. I just ditched it. These are my medium voltage equipment. I haven't actually automated a lot of these. Even though there's interfaces here, they're all empty. For the longest time, I was using drawers and conveyors to pull items in and then they get pulled out pushed into the interface of my A2 system. And same with my low voltage stuff. 
it's still not automated it probably never will be i just kind of run up and dump tons of items in and it'll just process them and push them back into the system and maybe in the future i'll build something here in the middle but it's kind of nice actually having this open this is kind of where i do my auto crafting you can see i don't really have that much stuff set up just the real bare bones i need to really improve that it's actually kind of funny how difficult these patterns how difficult these patterns are to make they actually cost these processor arrays they're quite expensive but we're getting there over here some more auto crafting we have the ingots the alloy smelters we have each one of these assemblers making the resistor transistor and capacitor here this guy makes cable with rubber we got our interface supplying rubber to submachines and polyethylene to other ones. Some of this I got to rework. I don't like the machines up top. I just threw them there, but they're, they're too, too out of reach. More circuits getting made. Really cool. I like how kind of compact and tight you can make some of this stuff. Kind of, kind of interesting, but it's too tall. Something else too that I love with this current playthrough is this hooked mod. I've never used it before. Since I'm keeping a ceiling on my entire base because of the rain, it's so annoying when it rains, I can just push C and it drags me up and then I can jump and drop and I can be building up here because uh, it's a personal thing of mine, but I, I don't like flight. I find when I get flight or jetpacks or creative flight, I get bored and I stop playing. I, I don't know what it is. It's like a mental mental wall. So this is really cool, this little grapple mod. And you can even do weird stuff like that, and then that, and then between these points you can actually climb and lower yourself. Double jump to get off. This was an early game oven, early game oven rather. For a certain type of circuit board you needed some of the, what is it called here, chemical reactor. You needed some of the phenol to make circuit boards, but... I don't seem to need it anymore, but I'm scared to tear it down because the minute I do, I'll probably need it for something. You can see it's got its own little sugarcane farm just for making steam, just to use this oven that I don't even use anymore. The output of it, this coke, I don't really think has too many uses, but might as well keep it. This is a simple little bubble, gravel, sandstone glass generator, obviously. It's hooked up with a storage drawer. Each one of these items are actually a framed trim. So all of these drawers are actually connected to this drawer, which has a storage bus. So my AE2 system can see all these items, which is very cool. Same as this array, which at some point I'm going to tear down because it's kind of obsolete. Over here is the start of me working with fluids. I'm kind of new to it, so this might go through a few different teardowns and revisions, but... Uh, Basically, we got the biofuel getting made. Um, yeah, it's turned into ethanol. I started naming each of these machines with what the output is. So ethanol is the output. This machine has two outputs, these two guys. And then these all output these various things. And they all get imported back into this fluid interface. And each of these are configured right now to deliver certain fluids. As you can see, different types of fluids were going in. Um, you have to keep one of these slots at least free. If you're trying to import fluids and there's no more room in the fluid storage drives, this apparently will actually jam and then everything breaks. So certain fluids like this uh, sulfuric acid generator that also makes hydrogen as a byproduct, the sulfur in the water makes way too much hydrogen for how much sulfuric acid I need. So that's that's like a prod, that's a, a liquid rather that I will destroy. If we come over here, somebody when I was streaming actually told me about this setup, which I thought was really cool. Maybe it's obvious, but I never considered it, was you put a fluid trash can here and then a fluid storage bus. And you set the priority really low so it'll only go in here if there's nowhere, nowhere else for it to go. And certain fluids that I definitely don't care about, hydrogen, this diluted stuff and oxygen I don't really care about it so I'll just trash it without being worried some of that other stuff if I produce too much of it I I want to know and I want to 
re remanage that situation. I don't want to just trash it because it's kind of expensive to make. So for right now, I'm selectively trashing stuff that I don't care about. And then the other stuff, when my system breaks, I'll just know that I have to come back and improve it. This, this is kind of my pride and joy here. This is my deep mob learning setup. The, the way they recommend it is you use the shulkers to make the diamonds. And you've got this setup here. They're all the exact same tier, making me quite a bit of power. Um, and all of these are shulkers. Making diamond diamonds, every single one of them. All of this stuff that gets made. So maybe just taking a quick walk through them here. We got pearls, which help me make the polymer to even run this machine. It's kind of circular, what do you call it, like a circular system? self-sufficient system we got uh, glowstone being made and also redstone on this particular one you know we got some copper getting made anything where they're doubled up down here is there two different outputs we got aluminum and gold come from the what is this thing called the guardian data model taking a quick look at it actually you can see these are all the outputs you can get at it so i've only asked for gold and aluminum I can expand it further this way I'm actually leaving these chunks open to maybe just keep expanding it I don't know if that's a good way to do it but that's just plan so far subject to change what's interesting though is if if I make too much like if I go to the one that has coal see how the coal's full and it's actually backing up I don't want it to jam up my inventory right so I actually have redstone logic from these emitters if uh, if I've got more than 30,000 coal in the system, it actually shuts off, which turns off the cyan redstone conduit, which is what is actually... Uh, you can't see it there, but there's a little cyan banner, kind of how like there's a little uh, magenta banner here, which allows this thing to extract. So since it's not redstone high on the cyan redstone, cyan set here too, I think, um, it can't extract and then obviously up top is a magenta one which is doing the left hand side and I've kind of just tried to keep the same color pattern because I can run down it with the conduit probe and do a right click copy and paste to stay organized and on the systems where I've doubled up like uh, redstone and glowstone I've had to add a different color and then a couple more emitters there's an extra emitter up top same with uh, that system over there has a lot more outputs too. What is that for curiosity? Oh yes, blaze rods, slime, nickel, coins, and sulfur dust. But yeah, I'm just kind of expanding it this way, and then I can expand it that way. So the cool thing is also, is all of these items, instead of using drawers, I decided to use a subnet from Applied Energistics. And... So all I can see on this little A2 system is just these items that come from this system. But my main system, that's the rest of this base, can see these items because I have a storage bus talking to an interface. That's kind of like a subnet. So green is my subnet and purple is my main net. So these items, if I go to Deep Mob Learning, I can see that, hey, these items are these exact items. And you might be wondering why was my coal shut off if I had set it for 30,000 to turn off, but it's only at 29. It's looking at this emitter here for 30,000. It's looking at the entire system. Of course, there's 30,000, so that's why it's shut off. Certain items in this setup, like the, uh, the byproducts, Let's see if I can find one, the models. So all these models here, look at the spider guy, for instance, He'll make this over, overworldian matter, and then you look at the Enderman. He'll make the extraterrestrial matter. So this matter is always getting produced, and you can see we've got tons of it. It's actually full, overworldian, extraterrestrial. See, so each one of these drives is partitioned and then labeled, so I know exactly what's supposed to be in it. And then when it fills up, the system won't jam because the lights turn off. The only stuff that's not managed by these level emitters is these matter things. 
because I just don't have a good way of doing it. So I did the same thing with the trash can. This time items instead of fluids. Use the storage bus, set your priority low, and you put what items you want to go in the trash. I have these items. And I, I went to all the work of doing the redstone instead of just trashing the extra items here. Because for me, it doesn't make sense having all these machines running and using like, uh, you know, your, your game logic. It makes the world leggier. If you can just turn off systems and have them, you know, not running, not using power, it seems to be more efficient to me to, uh, to do that. So I'm trying to stay organized like that. And this system, this system's pretty sweet. This is the pulsating clay polymer that allows you to run these data models to make these resources. So basically, this side is making the, what is this stuff called? Pulsating dust, and this is making clay. And you alloy them together. Wish I didn't do that, because now that's full again. I guess they can go in the main net. You get this stuff when they're alloyed. So this side is starting with cobble, you know, making gravel, sand, dust, and then we're making clay with the reactor. It sits in there, and then this is the setup for the pulsating dust, which is kind of interesting. It, uh, I think it's making glass. And I did it a little different here. We, this is my bottleneck, how slow the, the glass was getting made. So I made three furnaces. That get electrolyzed into quartz which happens really fast and then this part happens slow making this resonant clathrite so i've made two of them then of course the pearls get melted from this system the molten ender and then we make the clathrite and then the clathrite gets cooked into this so this is actually pretty fast my, my current bottleneck, of course, is this alloy smelter. So I probably could make a couple more smelters later. I'm higher. I'd have to tear a bunch of this down. But uh, this is now the bottleneck, which I never thought it would be. But there it is. And these are all medium voltage uh, tiered equipment with the energetic alloy size. So that's it. That is the early game setup. We'll see how it changes.